Um, awesome. So uh, my next talk is Introduction to Radio Inflammatory. So in this talk, I will walk you through some basic knowledge about how radio interferometers work, and this will help us understand how um, the data reduction should be done and how it will be different from purely single dish observations. So as a recap, radio astronomy means that we are observing in the radio wavelength, which makes uh, ground-based observation possible due to atmospheric transmission. So um, one interesting thing for radio telescope is that it is not like optical or infrared telescope where we really need to use pristine glass mirrors on those telescopes. So you can see from these images that um, uh, it is much more easily to build larger dish size for radio telescope because we don't need that glass mirrors. And this is actually because when the wavelengths come to like millimeter, centimeter, or even meter, it becomes much easier to ensure that the dish is smooth at this scale. And so, um, yeah, so just briefly explaining the figures, this is Green Bank Telescope, ELMA, and this is another telescope in the Green Bank Observatory. This is VOA, and this is a Arecibo, which no longer exists right now, so they already collapsed. But this was once the largest radio telescope in the world with 300 meters in diameter. So I think now there is even larger telescope. I think the fast is 500. But you can see that um, these like large dish telescope cannot really, uh, it like they cannot really move. So uh, it is not like uh, the other telescope shown here that is fully steerable. Okay, so, uh, so you can see it is definitely more easy to build larger dish size for radio telescope. But does that mean we can easily reach higher angular resolution than optical or infrared telescope? The answer is no, because uh, we know the angular resolution is actually determined by both the wavelength and the dish size. So even though larger dish, dish size does reduce the angular scale and give us better angular resolution, but remember in uh, in radio wavelength, the wavelength is much longer, so that uh, would worsen the angular resolution. So take Hubble Space Telescope as an example. So for a typical near-infrared wavelength of one micron with uh, their lens size of 2.4 meter, we get a resolution of 0.13 arc second. But if we want to reach that same resolution at millimeter wavelength, so millimeter, one millimeter is like a, a thousand times larger than one, one micron. So this means to get the same resolution, we need 2.4 kilometer diameter dish, which is just impossible, right? So I, I just mentioned like the largest dish it was 500 meter and they are even not movable. So that's why in radio, uh, in radio observations, we want to use arrays with smaller dishes to synthesize a big aperture to achieve this similarly high resolution. And this is called radio interferometry. So first of all, what is an interferometer? Um, so you may recall that from the physics classes, we all learn about the double slit experiment that um, uh, if there is like two different waves here, they can add up or cancel out each other and form alternating bright or dark patterns. And the radio interferometers are actually uh, a similar idea, but the difference is only that the, uh, the interference patterns measured by radio telescope is produced by multiplying the signals from different telescopes instead of adding up. So, here is an illustration of how interferometry works. So you can see that, uh, for example, if we have a signal from the sky, they would arrive at each antenna at uh, at different times because like there are location variations within these antennas. And then once they arrive each antenna, uh, the signals will be combined in a correlator, and there. Uh, they will measure the time delay and compensate it for the different location of antennas. But also, uh, you can imagine if we have different signals from the sky, um, there will also uh, they will also arrive the same antenna at different times because they are 
at a different positions from the sky. So this also provides the spatial distribution of sky brightness. So there are actually two components we need to consider. The one is that same signal arrives at different antennas with different times, and also uh, different signals arrive at the same antenna, also at different times because of location, uh, positional variations. So you can imagine that to, we need to precisely measure these difference in their arrival times. And so we need very accurate clocks in these telescopes. And the accuracy has to be way better than one, one wavelength we are observing. So for example, uh, the highest frequency band in ALMA, band 10, the one wavelength error will correspond to one picosecond. So we actually do need clocks that are accurate to one picosecond. And so uh, after the time delay is measured, the signals from each antenna will be amplified and then digitized and altogether sent to the correlator for um, calculating the, like multiplying and averaging the interference pattern. So this is actually a picture of a real, of a physical correlator, which you can see uh, in some, like, it's mostly located in some room in the observatory building, which is pretty cool. So here's a anima animation that I really like. You can see the whole process starting from uh, receiving the sky signal, being reflected by the main dish, and then focused again by the secondary mirror, and like all the signals are sent into the receiver. And in the front end, the signal will be uh, will be amplified and then turned to digital signals. And this is done for all antennas, and like all these signals are sent to the correlator for uh, multiplying and averaging. And this gives us the raw measurement from interferometers. So you may be wondering, uh, how does this whole thing eventually turn into beautiful images? So this is actually all because of Fourier transforms. So um, Fourier transform, uh, the Fourier theory uh, states that any well-behaved signals, including images, because like images basically is just a two-dimensional signal. So any well-behaved signals can be expressed as the sum of sinusoids. So this means we can decompose signals with Fourier transform into different waves at different frequencies. And this is a super useful transformation because uh, we can do this transform back and forth without actually losing any, any of the information of the original signal. So what the interferometers measure is actually on the frequency domain, which we call the visibility as a function of UV, which is uh, frequency, spatial frequency at both directions. And uh, this visibility can be converted into the sky brightness distribution or image through the Fourier transform. So here I'm just showing the functional form of Fourier transform. So as an example, here is a typical image as a function of x and y. And you can see if we do a Fourier transform, uh, um, it, we will get the visibility we measure. And it, composed, it is composed of amplitude and phase. So to interpret these visibility, we can think that, so basically each point, each UV point in this visibility contains information of this entire image. So uh, you can think of that visibility is actually showing how much the image has a certain frequency. And the face of the visibility is telling us where this frequency is located in the image. So this is just to give you an idea of what interferometers measure. And uh, I also want to show some useful Fourier transform pair that we, uh, we use a lot. So first of all, the Fourier transform of a delta function is a constant because you can imagine that delta function basically contains an infinite number of frequency at the same amplitude. And uh, uh, if we do a Fourier transform on elliptical Gaussian, it will still be a Gaussian. But you can see that after a Fourier transform, it does um, turn into a wider Gaussian. 
So one important rule for Fourier transform is that narrow features transform to white features and vice versa. And another uh, important example is that if we do a Fourier transform on a uniform disk, then this will give us a Bessel function with a decaying frame pattern. No one can see on the screen, but there are frame patterns decaying with uh, as the frequency goes higher. So, uh, so this the, uh, this fringe pattern is actually caused by the like the sharp feature uh, from here because uh, 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 yeah, because you can imagine like the sharp feature also contains like uh, many superpositions of like multi frequency waves, and uh, it and it will be decaying because like it is still a constrained signal. So an interesting example here is if, if we input the VOA antenna image, which is kind of like a uniform disk, then after the real transform, we will get patterns of Bessel functions. So uh, another rule of Fourier transform is that sharp, sharp features like edges will result in many high spatial features. And so currently we have been focusing on only the amplitude of the visibility. But what about phase? So as I mentioned, you can see uh, a center Gaussian uh, will be Fourier transformed into uh, also a Gaussian, but like it is wider in the amplitude. But since this Gaussian is in the center of the image, uh, you can see the phase is zero. But what if we have an offset Gaussian? So the Fourier transform for the Amplitude of the visibility is the same, but in the phase, you will see um, the fringe pattern um, to give us information about the location. So, um, so yeah, so another rule of Fourier transform amplitude tells you how much of a space frequency, uh, of a spatial frequency, and phase tells you where this frequency is. Okay, so now we know that image is the Fourier transform of the UV space, and we can go on to see how exactly does the observations work. So the idea is that we sample UV space at enough UV points using those small antennas so that we can synthesize a large aperture antenna with a size of the maximum uh, UV baseline. So um, this means that with every two antennas in our array, they will form a baseline. And this would, this baseline would actually correspond to a pair of UV points on the, on the UV plane. And to more completely sample the UV plane, we, act, we can actually fill in the rest by using Earth rotation. Or we can also uh, reconfigure the layout of these antennas to sample different points. So here are some real examples uh, from the submillimeter array SMA. It's easier to demonstrate because it only has eight antennas. So this figure here shows the most, I mean, the big black points here is showing the most extended configuration of SMA. You can see, so you can see the antennas are widely spread out. And so uh, if we uh, if we look at the UV plane, you will see that the UV coverage uh, thus spans a wider range covering up to like 500 kilo lambda. So um, just to emphasize again, you can see like every pair of these antenna would, would correspond to um, a pair of UV lines on this UV coverage. And the continuous arc you are seeing is due to uh, Earth rotation. So just by letting time pass, the Earth rotation will form this continuous line. And this is the second most extended configuration for SMA. You can see now the UV coverage definitely shrinks to the central region. And even more compact configuration is sampling the more central region in the UV space. And so to cover as much UV plane as possible, we definitely want to combine 
different configurations, um, just like this. And so this is exactly why we have a tutorial session led by Peter um, to teach us how to combine data from different array configurations. But you can see uh, with only eight and 10 arguments, even if we do combine all the array configurations, you can see there's still a lot of space in the UV plane that is not being filled. So what would happen if our UV coverage is not complete? So here I'm using the same image as an exam example. So you can see that if we mask out the high frequency part of the visibility, then Fourier transform will uh, only give us a blurred image that is actually only reconstructing the broad and diffuse features. And we cannot see the details, for example, of uh, his face or like other objects in the image. But it, on the other hand, if we mask out the central low frequency region, what we get from Fourier transform will only be um, the, the boundaries, like, like the lines, the sharp lines showing only um, the boundaries of things, which is basically the transitions where black to white or white to black happens. And we lose information of a smoother distribution. Like we definitely don't know which part is brighter or darker. And this figure here shows the UV space sampled by Alma. So you can see it's definitely a lot of improvement comparing with SMA, but definitely we can still see the UV coverage is incomplete. So for example, we actually cannot really avoid this central hole in this uh, UV in this UV plane using antenna arrays because you can imagine the shortest baseline formed by two antennas is limited by the antenna size, right? Like they cannot collapse. So using antenna array, we have a limitation of the uh, short space in coverage. And so that is why we really need uh, some single dish observations to cover that central hole. Um, yeah, so uh, in the afternoon, we will have, have a look at some real data from ELMA. So this is M100, which I also showed earlier. So uh, you can see that with 12 meter data and seven meter data, they are showing like different features. Like with 12 meter, you are only seeing a denser, clumpier emission. And in seven meter, you see diffuse extended emission. So for example, you can actually see like some features from the seven meter uh, that is not seen at all in soft meter just because it is resolved out um, by missing the uh, short spacing uh, using 12 meter array. And so uh, we will learn how to combine these like 12 meter, seven meter, and even the total power single dish observation to form uh, uh, data that we believe to be approaching what the real uh, what the real image is. So just as a summary, uh, the longest baseline of your array will determine the smallest angular structure, which is the angular resolution. And the conversely, the minimum baseline will determine the largest angular structure we can recover. So for interferometer observation, we actually really need to think about both. So usually people think about angular resolution, but the maximum angular scale is equally important because, uh, uh, for example, uh, if we are observing some more, um, some like interstellar media, like star forming regions, you can imagine there will be like hot cores and diffuse gas in between those regions. And if we have limit on the maximum angular scale, then those structures will be resolved out. We just don't detect it. And, but there is actually some upside on the limitation of maximum angular structure. For example, we don't actually need to care about uh, large scale atmospheric effect or um, there are like large scale variation in the sky brightness because we just don't see them. Uh, so there's actually a bit downsides. And uh, there is also the field of view. So this is determined by uh, the size of of one single antenna. So um, this is the dish size. So a key point is that the inter an interferometer is sensitive to a range of angular size 
that is determined by the maximum baseline and the minimum baseline. And the, your field of view will be dependent on the size of your single instance. So, uh, okay, so since this is a data processing workshop, uh, I want to emphasize that it is really important to know that UV coverage really matters when we reduce the data because um, what we get by directly Fourier transforming the measured visibility would be a dirty image as shown here, which includes the artifacts due to incomplete UV sampling. So you can see uh, there are definitely like some artifact like bright blocks here that are not from the real signal. So we need to get rid of these sampling effects when we do data reduction. And um, to do this, we actually also need to get the dirty beam or which we call the point spread function. So here uh, we can get the dirty beam by directly we are transforming the UV coverage. And um, so we can basically iteratively extract the effect of um, dirty being um, from the dirty image to reco recover the true sky fragments. So this will be covered more in detail in my tutorial session, but just to uh, give you a broad idea in advance. And finally, I just want to quickly demonstrate, I think this is cool to demonstrate the effect of UV coverage and the dirty beam. So you can see uh, with only two antennas, uh, we basically will only have a pair of UV points on the on the UV plane. And if we do a Fourier transform to get the dirty beam, uh, we can basically only have fringe pattern uh, in one direction. So we can only know the size and distance between things, but we cannot really learn anything more. Now, if we start to uh, we start to add some more antennas, we will start getting a little bit more information, like constraining uh, the uh, constraining the dirty beam, and adding in one more antenna. Four antennas is better, but still, like you, you still get a lot of side lobes, which is uh, what we call the the peak caused by the point square function. And you can see as we add more and more antennas, things quickly improve. And here, I also want to demonstrate that, uh, so both of these are from 16 antennas, but uh, the second one definitely has a more extended consideration. So you can see that the 30 beam uh, the beam size is much smaller than the previous one with more compact configuration. So this is a spatial filtering effect we mentioned. And with ELMA, we have uh, 50 antennas at, at least. And so to uh, improve the 30 beam, we can either um, we can we can either add in more antennas like this, or uh, we can uh, rely on the Earth rotation to um, have more coverage in the space. So uh, just a final review of the key parameters in radio interferometry. So first of all, the sensitivity is given by the number of antennas times their area, which is the total collecting area of, of the telescope. And the field of view is given by the beam size of a single antenna, which we call uh, the primary beam size. And the resolution is determined by the largest distance between the points. And conversely, the largest angular scale is determined by the shortest distance. So these parameters are all very important when you propose for ELMA observations because they will have a uh, observing pool that uh, you need to enter what sensitivity you want and what's the resolution, angular scale, and field of view that match with your so uh, this is uh, the end for an uh, introduction of radio interferometry. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Okay.